what one way you are approaching, because we're talking about different ways to run a WordPress <coughs> business, one way that you are approaching running your WordPress-based <coughs> or uh, fueled business. One way that you are approaching or what you are using as you run your WordPress-based fueled business. Uh, for us, it's all about um, sustainability and relationships. So that's why we focused on a, on a monthly fee as opposed to uh, doing project-based stuff, so we, uh, so I, I really like lifetime value and and recurring uh, re revenue through relationship with a handful of customers. Uh, yeah, so we build a membership plugin. Uh, we're in the product space of WordPress. Um, we're also releasing a theme soon, so we're going to tap into that market. Um, it's a lot better than consulting. I've I found just a personal preference in the product space, and I guess we'll chat about it a bit more soon. Okay, so my word is fascinating, um, because I, I like, I'm into creating that experience for the clients through a systemized system. Cool. Um, yeah, so we, we basically are moving towards productized services um, to generate recurring revenue. Um, that's one of our main pushes, so that, and that will s like be a foundation for our custom development work that we do for clients. So my phrase, I said in my talk, but communication is oxygen. Over communicate as much as possible. That's it. My comment is that developers tend to take on too much work. And um, because of that, the customer uh, service levels are compromised. Um, I don't think developers are good communicators, uh, with human beings that is, maybe with applications. Yeah. Hence my talk. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think um, the, the point you raised about the money is, is a critical one for, for clients because of those expectations and, um, and, and scope. That scope needs to be clearly defined and sometimes developers need to understand that even the clients don't understand the breadth and the scope of the scope, if you understand what I'm saying. A specific question is, how do you deal with your, um, your supply and demand of your capacity? Interesting. Um, so I'm in a very different situation to most. I don't have money to Friday available to me uh, to work on, on development work uh, because of the business I run with my wife. Um, so the specific thing that I have done, um, and it was one of the items on the, on the slide, but it wouldn't have made sense if you didn't see it, but I've speci very specifically niched down to what I offer. I don't do site builds. I don't do um, front-end development. Uh, I do plug-in and theme customizations, and that's all I do. So if a project, if I look at a project, if I look at a, a customer's description of the project, and I can see that it's going to be anything longer than about three days, I don't do it. Because I know that anything over three days um, is going to require more focus from myself than what I'm capable of giving the client. I need to be able to get it done within a three-day period, which for me is a week. Um, because by the time the weekend comes around, I'm then switching to the weekend business, and I can't then, I'm getting to that point now, and I don't mean to insult anybody who's older than me, but I'm getting to that point now where I can't remember what I was doing on the Friday when it comes to the Monday because of what's happened to me on the weekend. So my, my recommendation to, to freelancers who are going to be dealing uh, or anybody who's dealing with, you know, it's easy when you're working for a company or for an agency, you're, you're generally working with either a project manager or one client at a time. Um, when you're in the freelance space and you're working with multiple people, uh, my opinion, the best thing to do is to niche down. Um, and I would say for yourself, who is um, employing developers in a freelance capacity, uh, you might find that the, the, the way you can get the best value out of those developers is if you hire them for niche projects. So hire a front, don't, don't hire a generalist. Hire a front-end developer for your front-end work. Hire a back-end developer for your back-end work. Hire somebody to manage your database so that you get the best out of that person for that part of the project. That would be my opinion. Okay, so um, like I uh, explained in mine, I book clients in. So I, even sometimes I have to book um, clients in like a month. Um, you, you know it. It will only be like maybe two, three months later that I work with them. But I found that most of the times that um, that's in any case a good time for them to create the content and to get everything done. So, and then also that we have that dedicated time spent on them. And um, what John said, um, I also work with creatives and uh, photographers mostly. So the sites are very similar and um, 
we know that we can get it done in that in that week. It it doesn't always happen like that. There's always some things, and especially when there's like shops and membership sites, it's extra. But then you then you plan for that, and you know, you you book in more weeks. Yeah. But I think the working in weeks or days or whatever you prefer is a good way of of doing that. How do you guys get better, more, better quality clients? How do you guys get more, better quality clients? Um, so we used to build websites. Um, we kind of started off in the like low barrier mark. As soon as we pushed up our prices, when we were happy with our quality of work, the clientele is totally different. Uh, we found clients that were happy to pay like three times the rate that we were charging wasn't even making us jump through hoops. Like, they were super easy to work with. We find the super cheap clients were, you know, they, w they wanted to squeeze you for, for like that little bit of money. Um, so just raise your price um, gradually until you get to the point where you're happy with, and then you'll see a different clientele coming in. Um, something that I think is super important that a lot of people don't do is to create, uh, there's different names for it, but like an ideal client profile or a customer avatar, whatever that might, whatever name you've heard, if you've heard that before. But basically what you do is you, you kind of imagine your ideal client, give them a name, a gender, an age, um, as much of it like a demographic profile that you can, and then you, d you, 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 s you then from there you say, well, where do these people hang out? Like, will they be on LinkedIn? Will they be on Facebook? Will they be in Facebook groups? What kind of magazines would they read? And you, you build as much a, uh, as you can of like what that one person would be like. And then your, your, um, if you're going to spend money on um, PPC or if you're going to do SEO or whatever it is, whatever your content strategy is going to be, then you can um, take that profile and you can target that to that ideal person. And so like what Andrew was saying, ra raising your prices is a great thing, but um, now you've got this profile, you can decide, well, um, how, what kind of money does this person spend? What kind of thing do they expect? And so for us in our business, um, something that's important to us for our um, ideal client is that they are someone who runs a small business that's successful, but they're super busy, so they need an online presence, they need marketing done. They're intelligent enough to do it themselves, they can probably figure out how to do it themselves, but they're not interested because they love their business and they want to do what they do in their business. So they don't want to learn how to do what we do, so they see us as an expert. They're willing to pay for our time because it saves them time, right? So, so we turn away people who are like semi-DIY kind of people, who. Because what they do then is they say, well, I could do it myself, and that devalues us because they well, I can do it myself and save the money, um, or I can learn to do it myself. I don't really need you when they actually do. Okay, so from my point of view, you, you build an ideal client profile, and then you can target those people with your advertising and uh, your content, like your organic, your organic traffic content marketing, and you can go hang out in the Facebook groups that they're in. You can, you can find them on LinkedIn, that kind of thing. Yeah, I just uh, want to add to the um, fact with uh, raising your prices, um, how we've done it. We also uh, did just normal web design uh, for years, and we were also like coming in cheap just to get the clients and then living in that nightmare <laughs> so um but then we started to raise our prices but um we couldn't just you know increase the quote and expect everything to um fall in place so what we did is we started uh, writing uh, very detailed proposals and in the proposal you you say you set uh, your timelines your expectations uh, and you position yourself like you said uh, as as more of a consultant almost, um, and in that way you can uh, increase your prices because you're positioning yourself as a as a more professional uh, service. So uh, there's uh, there's a website called WP Elevation that gives you great tips on how to write very good WordPress specific proposals. So please repeat that website. Uh, WP Elevation. dot com. I just want to add one small thing to that. I don't think anybody here who works with clients or is, runs an agency or whatever doesn't know that information. But it's always about the fear. 
You know, if I, if I raise my prices, I'm going to lose clients. If I charge more, they're not going to want to work with me. Um, if you go online and you search for, um, those of you who, who know Pippin Williamson, um, he runs Sanyol's Development, uh, Easy Digital Downloads, Restrict Content Pro, they did a series of price increases that were, I think, either double or triple their original pricing, and they blogged about the process. And they lost clients, but they ended up earning more money and, being, and were able to then give their current clients way better support. So don't be fearful of making a change. If it has to be incremental, that's fine. If you want to go big and go hard, that's also fine. But don't be fearful of making that change to make a better life yourself. Super thoughts. It makes me think of Brendan Burchard and Jeff Walker. Jeff Walker is the guy from Product Launch Formula of PLF, wrote the book that launched, um, Brendan Burchard Experts Academy. And they will both speak deeply into this content, and they will say, it starts with good stuff. Make sure your stuff is good. And if when you've got good stuff, then you can raise your price. And that makes me think about what we were saying earlier, guys. Make, make sure you, you're creating the business that you want and that you will have fun with. And that links to what Shane, what I heard you say, is I want to work with the people I want to work with. It'll be fun. And when we're having that fun, we do better work and we get better uh, reputations, we get better feedback, we get customers that cross the line that actually do the stuff that we're offering, the services and the products. And so really good questions. So then the natural consequence of finding good, better quality customers and clients is that your business grows. So the question then is how do you, how do you guys where do you go to find a, a good development network, people that, can, that you can outsource to, that you can partner with as you want to grow and scale your business? Uh, there are different ways you can do it um, in my experience and understanding. So, so one of those is like something Jonathan mentioned when he was speaking, uh, which is like a service that he's a part of, but there's other ones like Upwork or, um, and it's hit and miss. <laughs> Um, I've we've we've used some developers um, and designers from from Upwork, um, and so, so like in the beginning, what I would do is I would pick two people, give them the same job, see how they do, and then um, you've got to pay double for that work. But you get to sort of figure out, you know, who who's like works the way that you want to, and um, so there's that. You can find freelancers online. There are, there are those ways. But other ways um, that I was discussing with some guys yesterday, actually. Um, let's say I build websites and I want to offer my clients marketing services, but, I, but I'm not upskilled enough and I don't have the time. There's a marketing agency. Um, you can um, work together. And a nice way that some people are willing to do it is you can white label one another's services, right? So they they would be a marketing company, um, but the client will be on your books. They will do the work. They'll white label it for you, so it still remains your client. Um, and then they could r they either give you um, like a percentage of whatever they make, or they reciprocate by sending you the kind of work that they don't do, but you do. Okay, so that's that's another idea. Um, and then also places like this, like WordCamp is like a perfect place to, so try and speak to as many people as possible. So I found Jonathan <laughs> at a WordCamp many years ago and if I need like serious hardcore development, he's my guy. And the same and the other thing is um, WP Elevation. So if you actually um, be, become part of the community and you do the course, uh, you, le you um, there are a lot of people and they, are, they do things the same way as you do it because you all do the same process. And so I met a girl, uh, Marika, she was also from Pretoria and now she, we, we do things together. She's more into the design and I'm more into the build and it, it works perfectly because we've got that same, same way of doing things. I can always say stuff, but I just want to touch on what, what Anshin said about the community. Get involved in the community. Get to know the people in the community. Build those relationships with the other people in the community. Um, I have met, just because I'm involved in you know, the WordPress Cape Town community and I come and visit Joburg whenever I can, just for WordCamp, um, and, I'm, and I'm involved in the Slack, I, I meet so many people with so many different skill levels that I can bug you know, um, Dane when I need some front-end answers or I can bug Andrew when I need some plug-in answers that I don't know or whatever. And the key thing there is to be involved. Don't join the Slack and then go, hey guys, I'm so-and-so from Soware and I'm looking for developers and then never say another thing again because then you become part of the noise again. 
So I'm not saying spend every hour of every every minute of every hour, but log on every now and then and say hi and see what conversation is happening and com you know communicate with us and get to know us because we are a friendly bunch. Um, if this is your first time at a WordCamp, you've probably found us all to be amazingly friendly and open and chatty, and that's who we are. That's kind of how WordPress is what it is. So get involved because when you get involved in the community, you meet all these people of different skill levels. You can then find out who they know and who, who they know who they know. And you, your network just – my network – since joining the local community in Cape Town has expanded like tenfold. Um, so get involved in those communities. How do you better delegate? So how do you communicate more effectively so that what is done is what you were asking for? Um, well, I, I think uh, it's important to use tools available, like project management tools, um, like Asana was mentioned earlier, and you also mentioned that. So I think tools like Asana or your own internal tools and even stuff like Google Docs can be really useful. And um, like Jonathan said, uh, over-communicate almost uh, internally. And uh, But it's never going to go perfectly. You just need to keep, uh, keep communicating and keep at it. And uh, uh, use the tools available to track progress and track time and um, track... Uh, communication uh, on, on specific tasks and projects and stuff. So that's, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, it's, it's always a struggle, but it helps if, uh, if um, team members got like a specific task they do. So with us, we, okay, we've got the process and Mareka does like a certain amount of the work or a specific side of the work and things like that, that there's specific roles, but it, it, it does, especially when there's more than one site, in, you know, when things, yeah, it becomes hard. Yeah, so what um, Anshin said about creating processes, so uh, kind of what I found is doing this for like 12 years, a lot of the processes are like in my brain, they look like a kind of muscle memory, and when, when somebody like new, you're getting someone new to do something, they'll ask you and then you'll, so I'll either just do it myself because it's quicker or I'll explain to them how to do it and then re-explain or something, you know? So what I realized is if I can do a video recording, uh, like a screen recording of that and keep it all together in like a repository of, of SOP, standard operating procedures, and then I give, like anyone new access to that and then it's like okay well um if they ask me how do i do the specific thing have you gone and checked it's there there's either screenshots or there's a video recording or something like that so i'm going to answer this question slightly differently because i don't currently work in an environment where i manage people um, i want to um, i want to eventually get to that point where i'm managing a team of some kind but i had the advantage or the privilege, at least, should I say, of managing the uh, WordCamp Cape Town organizing team this year. Um, and one of the biggest things that I discovered through that process is that, and I know this about myself, I'm a terrible manager. I'm a micromanager of note. Um, and if it's not being done, I'm going to get stuck in trying to do it myself, and then that means I'm doing everything. And that's not ideal. Um, so this year, I took a step back, and I, we, we organized teams within the team, and we organized team leads of people that I knew that I could trust. And then I just trusted them to do it. I trusted them to do what I know they can do. And I understood that if things did go wrong, I would at least then be in a situation where I could step in on that team if I needed to. Um, and obviously, it takes some time to build that trust. I had the advantage of that most of them were on the team last year when I was running around doing almost everything. But those that did what they did well, I then put them as team lead positions in, in the different teams. And that worked really, really well. So my, my suggestion would be to find people who you work on that trust and you get them to that point of trust and then just trust them to do what they do. But then again, communicate. You know, we had a situation this year where the lack of communication was a key warning sign to me that one of the team leads wasn't managing. And so I contacted him and I discovered that he was having some uh, family-related problems that was impacting his time. And it was a very delicate situation because I can't just walk in and say, look, I'm going to take over or whatever the case may be. So I had to kind of get him to make the decision to say, I'm going to step back. Can you get someone else to take over? And that's worked out well. Um, so being able to, to manage that kind of scenario is, is not something that's easy. But you know, if you, at least if you have people that you trust in other areas, then you can just deal with the, the fires that, that come up. 
Thank you. Uh, just from my side, as a as a business coach, you know, we use the the website address www.h, which stands for who, does what, where, and when, and how are they doing that. So, uh, Asana is a gift. It, I run my life off Asana and Evernote, literally my thinking life as well. But it can get you, you can lose traction of the granular specifics. So some of you have mentioned specifics. So one thing I've learned to do myself is to, to get good at what it is. When I'm saying, have you done it? What is it? And who, what, where, and how, specifically as, as granular as you can to that it. And that helps our teams uh, keep the traction.